Good evening and welcome to Guest Road Baptist Church Midweek Prayer Meeting, Wednesday Night Prayer Meeting for April the 14th. I'm Pastor Dan, Senior Pastor at Guest Road Baptist Church, and we appreciate you joining us tonight. We invite you to be a part of all of our services there online. Sunday mornings is at 1030. Uh, it is inside, or you can be outside and listen on the radio or watch online. Uh, Sunday nights is online only at 6 o'clock. Wednesday, 6 o'clock, we have a children's uh, message. Uh, then at Wednesday at 7, we have an adult uh, Bible study prayer meeting there. So I encourage you to be a part of that. If you need to contact us, if we can help you, if you'd like to make a prayer uh, request or request a prayer sheet that we have, uh, you can go to our webpage and find all the pertinent information for that, and we encourage you to do so. Again, we're glad to have you with us tonight. And as we begin, let's go to the Lord in prayer. Our Father in heaven, we are so thankful for allowing us to gather in the name of Jesus, and we gather, dear Father, this evening in the name of Jesus, and we gather for your glorification, dear Father. We know that you are in our midst as you promised to be with us always, and so we pray that your presence will be made known to our lives and to our hearts, and that we will respond to your divine presence in our midst, dear Father. Bless us in our moments of prayer, dear Father, and bless us, dear Father, in our Bible study of the Gospel of John this evening. And we pray all this in Jesus' name. Amen. Uh, each week we do have a prayer list. That prayer list has several different areas there. We do not publicize this list. As some people's information on there, they do not wish to share. But if you'd like a copy of it, as I said earlier, or if you'd like to make an addition to it, please uh, go to our webpage and you can find that information there. I uh, do want to share with you some prayer prompts to encourage you to pray. So uh, uh, let me share those with you. Uh, pray for our pandemic, for the vaccine there. Uh, we want to pray for our nation, our elected officials, uh, um, our public servants, our military. We certainly want to pray for our schools and our children and our colleges and the youth. We uh, certainly want to remember uh, the Church of Jesus Christ and pray for believers to grow in Christ's likeness and the fulfillment of his great command to love him and to love others and the great commission to go and make disciples. Uh, we pray for there to be a spiritual awakening among the lost to come to a realization of Jesus Christ he is the Son of God. He died on the cross to pay for their sins. We want to pray for their salvation there. Um, do, of course, want to pray uh, for the sick, the suffering, the needy, the rest homes, nursing homes, assisted living, and so forth is there. Uh, so I encourage you to pray for those things. I always want to encourage you to praise and to give thanksgiving to God. So let me share with you from Ephesians chapter 1, the third verse. It says, Blessed be the God and the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who hath blessed us with all spiritual blessings in heavenly places in Christ. Um, all spiritual blessings means all the spiritual re uh, enrichments or needs that one uh, has need of in order to have a spiritual life, a life in relationship to Christ here and now as disciples and then in the glorification when we are brought into his presence. Uh, it says here, blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ there. Uh, blessed here means to praise or to speak well of. So we should be praising God, thanking God, speaking well of God as he provides all that we need to have a relationship with him here and now and an eternal relationship with him. So God has blessed us with that, and so we should certainly be thankful for that. With those prayer prompts uh, mentioned and with the uh, uh, idea of praising God for blessing us with uh, all the uh, spiritual blessings we need that we might have a relationship with him. Let's bow our heads and let's go to the Lord in prayer at this time. Father, we do come again once more, dear Father, into your divine presence, and we come, dear Father, to lift up to you petitions and supplication, dear Father. There are many that are in need, dear Father. We pray for them. We ask your blessing upon them. Pray whether, dear Father, they are sick or whether they are suffering, lost a loved one, uh, having illness or or just distraught or distri strife in their life. Uh, whether they're shut in, homebound, and resting homes, rest homes. Father, we want to lift them up and pray your blessings upon them and ask you to encourage them, dear Father. Father, we also want to pray for your church, uh, to be your church, to be your people in worship and service of you and going out and sharing the gospel in love with the lost, dear Father. Pray for believers to grow as uh, imitators of Christ, as dearly loved children, walking in love as Christ has loved us. Father, we pray for lost souls to confess with their mouth and believe in their heart 
in the Lord Jesus Christ. We pray that you will lay someone upon our heart to pray for and to go to and to share the gospel with, and that your Holy Spirit would be upon them and that they would be quickened unto belief, dear Father. Father, we live in a world that seems to be waxing worse and worse and going further and further away from you. And so we pray for our world, dear Father. We pray for uh, the needs of our society as a whole. And we pray, dear God, for the great spiritual need that is there uh, for their salvation. We do lift up our elected officials, our public servants, our military, dear Father. We pray for our children in schools and for colleges, dear Father, there. And Father, we, of course, want to pray for the pandemic and ask your blessings there. Father, we ask your blessing upon our Bible study this evening, and we pray all this in Jesus Christ's holy name. Amen. Uh, Last Wednesday night uh, in our Bible study of the Gospel of John, we finished looking at John the Baptist's testimony. We had broken John the Baptist's testimony of Jesus as the Christ into two parts, and we looked at that second part uh, last week, and we saw how John the Apostle used John the Baptist's testimony to point to Jesus exclusively as the Messiah, as the Savior, and the proof that he gave uh, to that, and that proof being that John had carried out his ministry, which was the ministry of being the forerunner to point to Jesus as the Messiah, the proof of the Spirit descending upon Jesus as uh, proof of Jesus being the Messiah, Messiah, and then uh, the audible voice of God that came upon um, uh, came from heaven uh, saying, this is my son in whom I'm well pleased, is proof that Jesus is the Messiah. Now, this evening we come to John's uh, recording of Jesus' call of his first disciples. This is in chapter 1, verses 35 through 51. Now, I think we need to understand what we mean by the word disciple. Most of the time we define the word disciple as a follower. Uh, in Jesus' day, a disciple was a uh, more than just a follower, it was someone who poured their life into their rabbi, their teacher, their master, uh, in learning all that they taught and perpetuating what their uh, teacher or master taught, uh, and then trying to live and to look and to act and to think and to be just like uh, their master, to be a carbon copy. So when we talk about Jesus and disciples of Christ, we're not just talking about someone that says they follow him. No, we're talking about someone who is denying themselves and picking up their cross and following Jesus. This is the idea of they learn all they can uh, from Jesus, about Jesus, and it is to become like him in every regard and every area of life there. And um, sometimes we we don't see that full picture. So that's what we mean here. Now, John's account of Jesus is calling his disciples can be broken down into uh, chapter 1, verses 35 through uh, 42, where he calls Andrew, John, and Peter. And then uh, chapter 1, verses 43 through uh, 51, where he calls Philip and uh, Nathaniel there. And each of those two areas present different things we need to note. So we will break that down. So this evening, we're going to look at Jesus' call of uh, Andrew, John, and Peter here in chapter 1, verses 35 through 42. So let's begin by reading these verses. It says, And again the next day after John stood, and two of the disciples, and looking on Jesus as he walked, he saith, Behold the Lamb of God. And the two disciples heard him speak, and they followed Jesus. Then Jesus turned and saw them following, and saith unto them, What seek ye? They said unto him, Rabbi, which is to say, being interpreted, Master. Where dwellest thou? He saith unto them, Come and see. They came and saw where he dwelt and abode with him that day. For it was about the tenth hour. One of the two which heard John speak and followed him was Andrew, Simon Peter's brother. He first findeth his own brother Simon and saith unto him, We have found the Messiah, which is being interpreted the Christ. And he brought him to Jesus. And when Jesus beheld him, he said, Thou art Simon the son of Jonah, thou shalt be called Cephas, which is by interpretation a stone. Let's again ask God's blessing upon our little study this evening. Father, again, we pray you open your word to us and us to your word, dear Father. We pray that there will be an illumination through your spirit and to our heart and our mind, dear Father, to have an understanding uh, that is given to us here about Jesus calling his first disciples. And we ask this in Christ's name. Amen. Now, as I said, here is the call of uh, 
Jesus' very first disciples. Um, we're told that one of these disciples, of course, is Andrew in this passage. We're not told who the second one is, but most everybody believes it to be John, the author of this gospel, the son of Zebedee, the brother of James, uh, from evidences within the own gospel account and other evidences as well. And also we see here that Jesus calls Simon, who ends up being Peter or Cephas, uh, uh, a stone, a small rock there. Now, the narrative of the story is very simple and very clear. We have John the Baptist on the day after he's given his second testimony. So it's a four, third day period here. He stands up and he makes another testimony. Behold, the Lamb of God, uh, just as we saw last week, pointing to Jesus as the Christ. We see uh, from that testimony of John the Baptist that uh, uh, two of his own disciples here leave John and they begin to follow Jesus. We see that as these two men are following Jesus. Jesus turns them and uh, asks them what they're after, what they're looking at, and their response is, well, where do you dwell? Saying, we want to go with you. And so Jesus invites them, come and see. And they went and they stayed with him that day, it says. And uh, we're told that Andrew, um, at some point in time, goes and finds his brother uh, Simeon here and tells him that we have found the Messiah, uh, the promised one, the Redeemer, and he brings uh, Simon with him. And when Simon is brought into Jesus' presence, that he renames him uh, Cephas there or Peter, a small stone there. Now, as we look at this, what we need to do is to look at it in the whole picture of the concept of Jesus calling disciples. So let's note several things here to help us understand Jesus is calling of disciples, then these first disciples, and helping us to see Jesus is calling disciples today. First, we need to realize that uh, here, John the Apostle is making uh, a great step, as we concluded our, our thoughts in last study with, and that great step is that John the Baptist, his uh, ministry is ceasing or backing away, uh, and Jesus' uh, ministry is starting and stepping up. We see that John was the forerunner. He's pointed. He's fulfilled that message, uh, that ministry, and now we see that John is going to begin to speak about Jesus himself. Now we see see this change taking place because John has stood up and fulfilled his responsibilities. He said again for the second time here in two days in a row, behold the Lamb of God here. And we talked about that last Wednesday night, so we won't go through that idea again here. But we also see the idea that John is decreasing and Jesus is increasing as we see two of John's own disciples leaving John and following Jesus. This means that they were followers of John the Baptist. They were learning all he was, perpetuating all he taught, trying to live and look and be and uh, exemplify him in this world. And they stopped, they ceased doing that, and they moved over to Jesus to become his disciples. Now, we should note that this transition from uh, the forerunner, John the Baptist uh, ministry, to the ministry of Jesus was the plan. This was God's plan. This is what it was supposed to be. John was to introduce the Messiah, who is Jesus, and then Jesus was to step up, and he is. We not only see this was the plan, we see this was necessary because John was not the Christ. He was not even Elijah. He was not even that prophet there. He was just a voice of one crying out, pointing to the Messiah. So it was necessary. We see that this also means John has fulfilled his ministry, the ministry that God gave him. He carried it out. He completed his task. And we see now here finally that Jesus is beginning to carry out and fulfill the task that God the Father has given him as the Messiah there. So we see, first of all, that John the Apostle is making this shift. And we need to note that shift because it is the plan. It's necessary. John has fulfilled his ministry and Jesus is beginning his ministry. Now, the second thing we need to notice here is we look at this passage as a whole about Jesus' calling his first disciples is people do respond. Let me repeat that. People do respond to a testimony about Jesus. We see that Andrew and John responded to the testimony of John the Baptist when he said, Behold the Lamb of the God, as he saw Jesus coming. And we see that Andrew and John heard that. They left John, ceased being his disciples, and they went after Jesus. So we know that that testimony of someone 
for Jesus can be affected. If we go even further into the uh, uh, passage tonight, we see that uh, Andrew here, he went and found uh, his brother Simon, and what did he say? We found the Messiah. We found the promised one. We found the anointed one. We found the Christ. We found the Savior. And what happened? Simon Simeon got up, and he went with him. And when he went with him, what happened? He met Jesus, and Jesus changed his name from Simeon unto uh, Cephas, or Peter, small rock there. So people do respond to a testimony about Jesus. Too many times we think, well, it's not, it's not worth it. We don't, we don't have a chance. We can't convince anybody. We don't have to convince them. We just, we're not told to convince them. We're not told to save them. We're just told to point them to Jesus. And that's what John was doing. That's what Andrew did, and it was successful there. Thirdly, here we need to notice the question uh, that Jesus asked Andrew and John as they're following him. He turns to them as he sees him following him. He says, what seek ye? Now, of course, we need to look at that in the physical concept. What are you after? Why are you following me? That is a physical thing. What do you want? You're walking behind me. What do you want? Now, this, of course, isn't Jesus being paranoid. This isn't Jesus trying to run them off. It's, but we need to understand it. It was in that physical context. But we need to also see that Jesus has the implication of this question. What seek ye of going deeper? Because you see, John, uh, uh, Andrew and John were seeking something. And what they were seeking was a relationship with Jesus based on the testimony of John the Baptist, of Jesus being the Messiah, being the promised one of God. And so Jesus knew this. You've got to remember, he's fully God and fully man. John the Apostle has already explained that as we've seen him as God incarnate there. And so Jesus is asking this on the top question, but it has this deep spiritual undertow here. Jesus is still asking that same question today. What do you want? What are you seeking for? And he's asking it through his Holy Spirit there. Fourthly, we need to note Andrew and John's answer to Jesus' question. When Jesus says, what are you seeking? They say, Rabbi, where dwellest thou? Now, the word rabbi here being interpreted means master, it means teacher, it means one who would be in a position of authority, one who would become the teacher, become the master of a disciple, someone who would teach and would help their student to become fully knowledge of what they know, what they teach, help their student perpetuate what they teach, and then help their student to look and emulate them uh, just as um, we said a disciple was there. And so they say, Rabbi, where dwellest thou? Now, again, we take that into physical sense in that um, where do you live? Where, where are you staying? Where is your place? Where is your tent put up, so to speak, there? But again, here is a deeper spiritual undertow in that they're saying, as we just said, when Jesus asked them, "Who, uh, what seek ye there? And they say, where dwellest thou? They are actually saying, well, we want a relationship with you. We've heard John, our former master, our former teacher, our former rabbi, say that you are the Lamb of God. We know he's not. He's the forerunner. He said that all along. He's just pointing us to you. And so we want to come in and come along and be in this relationship with you today. Today, people are still looking for Jesus. There's this big spiritual gap in our lives. And that big spiritual gap that is in our life is there because we were created to be in a relationship with God. So therefore... We're looking to feel that now oftentimes and most of the time and all the time apart from Christ, we are looking in all the wrong places to try to fill that spiritual gap there. But men are still looking to feel that, and Jesus is the answer there, and that is to come into that relationship with him. Fifthly, let's notice here that Jesus is, uh, notice Jesus' response when Andrew and John say, uh, we're, uh, Rabbi, where dwellest thou? We're desiring this to know where you are, to have in this enter into this relationship. And what does Jesus say? He says, come and see. You see, Jesus didn't turn them away. Jesus didn't say, okay, well, let me go think about it. Jesus didn't say, okay, bring me your references. Jesus didn't say, okay, you write this 25-page essay, hey, and I'll read it, and we'll see if you're up to snuff to come on my team here. Jesus didn't do any of that. Jesus lovingly, openly opened his arms, and he invited them to come in, come and see. This, again, is in the physical sense, and this, again, is in the spiritual sense. 
This is in the physical senses. He's inviting them to come to his house and in that culture and that time to come where Jesus is staying, rather, uh, as he did not have a house uh, there, would be an idea of intimate, deep fellowship. And so he's inviting them in to that physical relationship with him of intimacy, of uh, fellowship there. But he's also inviting them into this deep spiritual sense of unity with him there. And then finally here, let's notice that when Sim, uh, Simeon comes uh, here, um, that Jesus knows him divinely. Look at what he says. Thou art Simon, the son of Jonah, thou shalt be called Cephas. He knew who he was in the literal physical sense again, but there's a spirit, big spiritual thing that's taking place. And this spiritual thing is he called him or renamed him Cephas, stone, a stone, a rock, a small stone, a small, small rock, Peter Petro, Petros in the uh, idea there. And so he changed his name. Now, we're not told at this point in time what the reasoning for that was. But we know, and most would say, since this is written after all of Jesus' ministry has taken place, that the readers of John's Gospels would have some idea of this, that Jesus is here saying, or setting up, brother, the future. He knows not only uh, Peter here in this physical sense, but he knows him in the spiritual sense. And in that spiritual sense, in the future spiritual sense, he is setting this up for Peter to become the rock, the small rock, which he builds his church on. Not that Peter is the rock. Christ is the foundational rock. But Peter is the instrument, that small rock that he's using. So it shows us he has this foreknowledge. It's also showing us that not only does Jesus know us in the physical sense, he has a plan for us as his disciples. When we come to him, there's a plan, there's a purpose, there's something he has called us to do and to use us for to bring about his kingdom, to bring about his glory, his kingdom, his will being done here on earth as it is in heaven. Now, those are the six things we see. And those six things are, same, are just as true today as they were then when Jesus was calling these disciples. All ministry must cease but the ministry of Christ. We're not forerunners. We are postrunners of Christ. And our job is not to be the one to prepare people for the coming, but to help them understand he has come. But it is Christ who is at the center as he is still the forefront of all there is from God to man, just as he was then. That is foundational for discipleship to take place. Secondly, just as Andrew, just as Peter, just as John, all responded to a testimony for Christ to become disciples, when we stand up and we share the gospel of Jesus, when we point to Jesus, there will be disciples. Not everybody's going to believe. That's unfortunate. That's horrible truth, but it is the truth. But the truth is, instead of it being half empty, look at it half full. Some will believe. Some will heed. Just as Andrew and John did, just as Peter did, they will believe. So when we think about disciples, it is in based on that ministry of Christ Jesus, just as it was then. It's based on our sharing about Jesus. And then thirdly, just as... Uh, Jesus asks, what are you seeking? Jesus still, as I said earlier, speaks to man today through the Holy Spirit. What are you seeking? Why does he ask that question through the Holy Spirit? By the movement of the Spirit as he convicts his man of sin, judgment, and righteousness. It is because man is seeking something. Just as uh, uh, John and Andrew were seeking, uh, Rabbi, where dwellest thou? Crying for that relationship. Man is seeking, as I said earlier, to fill that hole. And Jesus is the only thing that's going to fill that hole in our life. Just as Jesus responded to Andrew and to John, come and see, come into this relationship. I invite you to come in and to be a part of me, to come into fellowship, to koinonia, which is the Greek word for fellowship, which means much more than just meeting together and talking together or having a fellowship meal. It is the idea of such a close, intimate relationship where you know one another. Again, that idea of discipleship being repetitive there. there. He always accepts those who are seeking and come to Jesus. 
when the testimony is given and somebody responds to that and they follow and they're crying out oh, to Jesus, when they fall under the convicting work of the Holy Spirit, when he says to them, uh, to them, what seek ye? And they're saying, we're looking for that Savior. We're looking to fill that hole. Jesus says, okay, come on in. I'll save you. Because you see, Jesus came to seek and to save that which is lost. He did not come to judge. He came to save. There will be a time of judgment, but he came to save. So disciples are made now just as they were then through God speaking to men and in God accepting men when they respond to him by saying, come and see me. And just as the disciple Peter had a preset ministry plan work for God, there's a preset ministry plan and work for disciples today for God. Simply, the things we see that are in place and we see the things that are taking place, Jesus is the foundation of the ministry of life now. Testifying to Jesus as that Messiah. Men responding. Seeking. Jesus saying, speaking to them. And they're looking for that feeling. And Jesus exciting them to come in, come and see. And giving them that relationship. And having a plan and ministry for their life. It is the same today as it was in Jesus' day. Not a single solitary thing is changed about discipleship. It is all based on Jesus. It is a perpetual cycle of a disciple shares and others will respond. They will come and seek Jesus. Jesus will come to them him, and question them and ask them what are you looking for. If they cry out to him, he will accept them and then he will put them to work. This is the logical step in John's gospel. You see, he has been planning and working and, and setting forth everything to this point of Jesus being the Savior, which he is. But he's got to get people to understand that he is not just saving them to put them into a religious situation or a religious station or a religious position. He is calling them into a relationship with him that is personal through Christ as their Savior, as He becomes their Rabbi, their Master, their Lord. And we see that being set forth here in this calling of Andrew, John, and Peter. Now, that brings us to the next thing, the next part when we see uh, the calling of uh, Philip and Nathaniel. And when we come to that in our next study, we will see that there are some more truths being set forth about discipleship to give us a fuller, broader understanding of discipleship, which will build on what we've seen here this evening. So, in our next study, that's where we're going to pick up, and it will be a building upon what we've seen tonight about discipleship and help us to have that deeper stronger understanding of coming to Jesus as our Savior and in growing in our relationship with Him. Again, I pray God will bless you and keep you. I hope He uh, will bless you beyond measure, make His face shine upon you, and that you will love Him with all of your heart, mind, soul, and strength and courage, and you will share Him with the world. God bless you. Have a good evening. We'll close with a word of prayer. Father, again, thank you for Jesus. Thank you for letting us be his disciples. Help us to know, dear Father, that he is first. Help us to share him with the world, that your spirit may speak to them and ask, what are you seeking? And may people come and say, hey, they want a relationship with you, for Jesus will accept them and put them to work with his plan for your kingdom. Father, go with us. Give us the opportunity to love, to serve you, to love and to serve others. And may we not pass that up. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. God bless you.